You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host, author, and occasional misanthrope, Juliet Miranda. Go to theunwritablerant.com and you can subscribe on iTunes or connect with the show on Facebook and Twitter. Hey there, y'all. It's Juliette Miranda. You are listening to episode number 69 of the Unwritable Rant podcast. Tis the season to be given gifts of bourbon. Y'all, I have an absolutely fantastic bourbon to share with you today. So let's get this thing rolling. Get a glass, fill it up with something tasty and strong, and let's say cheers. Ugh, bourbon. (laughs) This might be one of my new favorite bourbons, y'all. This is Barrel Bourbon, batch number nine. It is cask strength, 112 proof, and it is aged for 13 years. I have to say, this tastes like Aruba in a bourbon, which is an incredibly strange description, I know, but hear me out because it is so rich and so full of flavor. Y'all, this might be the greatest bourbon ever. It almost has a sort of toasted coconut flavor to it. And the mouthfeel is almost chewy, very caramel-like. It's rich, it's creamy, but it's also got that hefty sort of spice to it, so it doesn't taste like a dessert. It just tastes like this wonderful tropical sort of bourbon. Now, I've got this opened up with just a little bit of water. Kind of tempers out the strength of it, and it just turns it into this tropical, fruity, toasted with a little bit of leather on the end flavor. Y'all, I am going to be sucking this stuff down for as long as I possibly can because it's so damn good. I don't know what is going on in the Midwest, y'all, but we are getting slammed with snow. Every single weekend, more of it just pours out of the sky. It's driving me insane. My guy and I have pretty much gone into hibernation mode. It's our only means of defense against this weather. Neither one of us wants to go outside. So instead, we're coming up with little projects in the house to keep ourselves busy. I've been doing a lot of baking and cooking, and the other night I decided I wanted to expand my culinary horizons and try making a flambe dish. Oh yeah, yeah, I wanted to deliberately set a fire in my kitchen. I mean, I love fire. It's just so exciting. And every time, you know, I go to a Greek restaurant with my guy, we always order flaming saganaki. And every time somebody yells opa, I think, I could totally do that. Besides, there's just something magically delicious about the way fire kind of quells that bite of alcohol and turns a dish into a toasty, caramelized plate of heaven. I mean, really, why should I wait to go to New Orleans for real bananas foster or, or, you know, pay some guy in an apron to flame my cheese? I have enough bravado to be certain that my kitchen skills absolutely extend to flambéing. I totally have experience with fire. In fact, about a week ago, I set my kitchen on fire. Now, this one wasn't intentional by any means, and I feel the need to point that out only because I suspect some of you may feel I have a penchant for destructive behavior. And not surprisingly, it wasn't my first kitchen fire. Although I really don't count the other incident, because it was a result of my accidentally sliding a Rachel Ray cookbook into the flames of our gas burner. Now, the book was a gift, one that left me completely and totally annoyed, because I hate Rachel Ray. And as I watched the flames lick at that smug bitch's face, I couldn't help but thinking, you're not quacking yummo now, are you, whore? Well, that notwithstanding, about a week ago, I had a lovely pan of grease and breaded chicken bubbling away, and I turned my back for one minute to deal with whatever it was that caught my attention, likely some sort of shiny object, and the next thing I know, There is a billow of smoke, a whoosh, and I'm scrambling around like I love Lucy. Why is it the fires always seem to crop up when you are not looking? Now, I knew enough to not dump a kettle of water over my burning pot, but that was about as far as my brain went before breaking out into a deranged rendition of the stop, drop, and roll fire safety song that I learned when I was a Girl Scout. I'm guessing... That wasn't what they intended back in first grade when they taught us that song. Of course, then again, they probably didn't figure any one of us would grow up to be so distracted by the glitter on a Christmas card that they started grease fire one burner over. Now, in the end, my instincts finally kicked in, and I 
managed to slam a lid on the pot before my kitchen turned into a towering inferno. Of course, it didn't help that my guy came home from running errands that night to a bowl of buttered noodles and a vague, charred sort of smell to the house. Which he was quick to point out last night when I was telling him about our little dinner menu. Hey, if he didn't see it, it didn't happen. Besides, that mini, not quite fire was unintentional at worst. For this meal, I'm talking Cajun shrimp. They're going to be in a controlled environment. And according to my research, the quarter cup or so of cognac would only produce a very quick little, you know, burst of fire. And then it would subside into a bubbling sauce of tasty, delicious goodness. Now, my guy shook his head and he said, all right, have at it, honey, but I'm not expecting much. Well, there's no stopping me when I get in a mood like that. And my guy knew it was much. Of course, he typically has more sense about these things than I do, so he kept a safe distance from the stove when I was standing there with my kitchen lighter. I was ready to flambe, armed only with my unbridled love of food and my overinflated sense of confidence. My guy, of course, had the fire extinguisher at the ready. Now, the sauté portion of cooking went exactly as it should, and my shrimp were sizzling just as they do on TV. So I feel it. I feel the moment coming, and I know it is time, and I am ready to set these suckers on fire. So I grab my cognac, I inhale the lovely scent of garlic and butter and delusion, and I add it all to the hot pan as instructed. And with a quick flick, I ignite the kitchen lighter, brace myself for the inevitable, and touch the tip of the flame to the pan sauce. And then I waited. And I waited some more. There was no whoosh. There was no opa moment. I wanted fire, and all I got was a little bit of crackle as the sauce continued to simmer mockingly. All of my preparation and bravado and bragging, yeah, it came to nothing. Nothing but a little bit of crackling sauce, and my guy is doubled over on the floor as I am swearing at the dinner. I'm like, burn, damn you, burn, you whore. All of my caution just went right out the window at that point. And I lean over that pan. I slosh a bunch more cognac in it. And I'm trying to get the stupid childproof kitchen lighter to light again. And my guy comes up behind me and he's got to wrench that thing out of my grasp before I can do any real damage. Because I'm getting weird. I've got the burner going full fire at this point. And I'm like, I need one more chance. I can set this goddamn thing on fire. I swear I can. And my guy, of course, has to pat me on the head. He's got to be like, simmer down there, Hemingway. It wasn't meant to be. He's like, let me try it. I'm a man. I can set things on fire. So I'm like, fine, you try. Well, of course, he's stumbling with the kitchen lighter, too. I don't know why they make these things. I'm an adult. I can light a lighter. I don't need to have my finger locked down on like four buttons just to get a little burst of flame. Not that it mattered, because he didn't do any better than I did. He maybe got one shrimp on fire for a second or two, and the dish just kept sizzling on as if it were coated in sodium silicate and not 100-proof liquor. Well, at that point, I suggested we give up our dreams of flambe and just serve the dish as it was before that thing overcooked. And while our not-so-flaming Cajun shrimp were delicious, I couldn't help but think that I'd had far more success in setting Rachel Ray on fire. And while this didn't entirely surprise me, It did make me just the slightest bit sad. I think I'd better have some more bourbon, y'all. Hang on. Oh, there we go. (laughs) Now, I'm sure if I had used this bourbon, I could have set the entire kitchen on fire, but it was not meant to be. I'm sure none of you will be surprised to learn that that is not the only dinner I've made that's had unfortunate consequences. Now, of course, that meal was an accident. Other meals, well... Let's just say my intentions weren't quite as thoughtful. And I'm thinking of a holiday meal I made back when I lived in Los Angeles, and I was living with a guy that I'll call the warden. If you were to ask me what the single worst relationship I've ever been in was, I would say without hesitation that it'd be the warden. The warden was an anxiety-ridden, insanely jealous, manipulative, controlling dickhead musician. And this relationship had the added horror of the fact that I had been living with him for almost two years. The warden hated the fact that I worked in the music industry at the time, despite the fact that that was how I had met him. He was the kind of guy who, if I was 
interviewing a band over the telephone, would sit in on the other line and listen to make sure that nobody was flirting with me. He used to follow me to the hair salon to make sure I didn't enjoy my hair shampoo too much. He was so high strung and so over the top, ridiculously, irrationally horrible that I actually used to crumple up St. John's wort and spike his coffee with it every morning with the hopes that it would mellow him out a little bit. I have no idea whether it did or not, but it gave me a small sense of control in an otherwise out of control, horrible relationship. And I will tell you exactly what it was that made me come to my senses. Getting laid off. It wasn't the threat of not having a job. It was the thought that now I was going to have to literally spend all day, every day living with this guy. That is what made me realize I had to end that relationship as soon as I possibly could. Now I admit I was a little bit of a chicken shit in doing it. I've never been much of one for confrontation, and... The warden was a big, burly kind of guy. I didn't think he'd handle a breakup very well. I'd once watched him put his fist through a door over an argument with one of his bandmates. So you can understand why I decided that my best option was to move out the day he left for tour. I spent the first four weeks of my unemployment scouring the valley, looking for an apartment that wouldn't drain my meager savings and that put a big enough buffer zone between me and that asshole warden. And it was tricky business doing all of this under the covert operative that I had set up, masquerading as a job hunt. Fortunately, however, I found a place, made all the appropriate arrangements, and just had to wait it out. Now, you have to understand that this put a tremendous amount of stress on me. And I got down to the last week before the warden left and I moved out, and I'm starting to panic a little bit. Because here's the thing about bad relationships. If you stay in them long enough, they start to seem normal. And I'm thinking maybe I'm making a terrible mistake. I could have very easily stayed with a warden and let him handle all the finances. I'm thinking maybe I'm not going to be able to make it on my own. Maybe I'm never going to find a job. But then, of course, the warden reminded me exactly how smart of a decision I'd made that one particular night. I was making us dinner, and I was distracted and confused and As a result, I wound up overcooking our pasta. We're talking seriously overcooking. This is like two-day-old Olive Garden reheated in the microwave overcooked. Not good. But it's pasta, right? So I served it anyway because who really cares? Well, the warden cared. He took one bite of that pasta, put it down and said, This is overcooked. I can't eat this. Well, I decided to make a joke out of it at first. I said, really? Can you also feel the pee under your mattress, princess? Well, he didn't find that as funny as I did. And he puts his fork down and he looks at me all stern and says, I think we need to have a talk. And I get excited for a moment because I think maybe he's going to break up with me. That would save me so much trouble and drama and hassle. So I'm like, yes, yes, let's talk. And he says, well, here's the thing. For the past couple of weeks, You really haven't been a very attentive girlfriend, and I don't feel like you're giving this relationship the attention that it needs. And I'm looking at this guy, and I am feeling two years worth of anger rise up in the back of my throat like a shot of bad tequila, and I'm about to spit all of this venom out at him. Of course I was distracted. Of course I was pissed off and angry, and I was doing my best to distance myself from him so that I could check out easily. But I'm thinking maybe, maybe it's not going to be that easy. Maybe we are going to have that blow up fight. And he's staring at me with this obnoxious look on his face as if he was expecting me to rebel. But I'll be honest with y'all, I chickened out. He was the kind of guy who just wouldn't respond well. He wouldn't feel hurt. He would just feel anger. And he would probably throw all of my shit out the window into the pool below it. I didn't want that to happen. I just wanted to get the hell out. But I also wanted to fuck with him a little bit. My sociopathic tendencies were kicking in, so I looked at him, swallowed all of my anger, and I said, You know what? You're right. I'm so sorry. And he says, You should be. Just because you lost your job is no excuse to treat this relationship poorly. And I said, I couldn't agree with you more. And to make it up to you, how about I make us a fabulous gourmet dinner the night before you leave for tour? 
Well, that seems to satisfy him a little bit because he looks at me and he says, I guess that's a start. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you for accepting my apology and my goodwill gesture, you dick. That gave me a couple of days to plan. And I considered a lot of things. Arsenic, rat poison, laxatives. But I didn't want to spike his food with anything that would jeopardize him leaving for tour the next day. So I had to scratch those off and come up with something that would do just what I needed it to do. Something that would taste good, but that would sit with him forever. And then like the star on top of our Christmas tree, an idea just lit up my entire being. And I knew exactly what I had to do. Well, I got to cooking and I spent that entire day at it. I found the perfect recipe. I was going to make ravioli. I even made the dough from scratch. And I'll tell you, ravioli is a complicated little dish to make. You have to get that dough just right. Consistency's got to be perfect. You don't want it too heavy. You need it to contain its filling. You don't want it to taste like a pizza pocket. And the same goes for the filling. It can't be too runny or it will seep out of that ravioli shell. And again, it can't be too thick or too dry. It's got to be just right. And I found the perfect, perfect balance. I cooked those suckers up and wow, did they look good. I even made a lovely Alfredo sauce to go on top of it. And I did the whole evening up big. Candles on the table, fine china, cloth napkins. I mean, I really wanted him to enjoy this final meal that we were going to be sharing together. And it was the holidays too, so it had to be a little festive. I mean, truly, it was a real, you know, fancy feast, if you will. Oh, and he ate up every single one of those ravioli. He really seemed to be enjoying them. So much so that he asked for seconds, but I didn't have any seconds to give him. I only had what was on my plate, and, well, I couldn't give him those because they were a little bit different than his. But no matter, he made it through the meal, and the next morning, as scheduled, he hopped into that van with the rest of his bandmates and waved as he drove off to Las Vegas, not realizing, of course, that I was about three steps away from packing up everything that I owned into my own moving van and getting the hell out of Dodge. But before I left, I wrote him a little letter, and in it I listed out a lot of the reasons why I was leaving him. I was tired of being controlled and manipulated and taking a backseat to his precious guitars. But I added a little postscript at the end of the letter, and I said, Since you enjoyed our final meal together so much, I just wanted to leave you the recipe for it in case the girl that I'm fairly confident you're already dating, she'll have everything she needs. So I listed out the ingredients of the ravioli, and then I included the ingredients of the filling. And the filling, of course, was surprisingly easy. It simply consisted of two cans of the tender liver and chicken variety of Fancy Feast cat food. Well, about a week later or so, I'm set up in my new apartment and I get a phone call from him, raging about how I could have killed him, feeding him cat food like that, screaming at me about how it wasn't fit for humans. And I had to pause and suck in my laughter and say, well, you need to have a heart to be a human, so I guess you're all right. That just set him off on another tirade, telling me what a rotten, horrible person I am, never once addressing anything that I had written in the letter. And he concluded the call by insisting I sent him back his DVD player or he was going to call the cops and have it reported stolen. Well, I sent him a care package, of course, but I didn't include the DVD player. I just threw in a couple more cans of Fancy Feast cat food with a little note that said, I hope you choke on it. Happy holidays, asshole. Now, I have done a lot of cooking since then, and I've set some things on fire. I've made some great meals and some not-so-great meals, but none of them quite compare to Fancy Feast Ravioli. And now I'm going to have some more of this barrel bourbon. Hang on, y'all. Ugh, you know, the more I drink this bourbon, the more it just tastes like marshmallows and butter, and it's just so rich and delicious. I am in love with this bourbon. So I think I'm going to curl up with it and uh, have myself a merry little evening and let my guy handle the cooking for the night. Now you can find The Unwritable Rant on iTunes and iHeartRadio and Stitcher, or you can just go to theunwritablerant.com. Every single episode is right there for your listening pleasure. And as always, you can hit me up on Twitter, at Morning Neurosis.
I'll be happy to chat with you there and would love your bourbon suggestions. I'm developing a very tasty looking list for the new year, so I would love to hear what you want me to drink. And now I am off, y'all. I'll be back next Sunday with more bourbon and more stories. Cheers, y'all. As pretty as a Sunday morning, standing on the corner at Carondelet. What you say we make our way up to Bourbon? A couple hurricanes and a hand grenade and get blown away. Let the chips fall where they may. If it's all the same, what you say, Bon Ton Lay. Hey, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You can be the flower on my magnolia Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this